Testing one, two, three. Welcome to another Woke Wednesday. This podcast was created to shed light on different societal issues, which have been at the forefront of public discourse through one of the most divisive times in American history. More so, it was created with the intent of allowing those who have often been neglected, shunned, or misunderstood to have a chance to share their experiences and thoughts. I hope this dialogue encourages critical conversation and activism amongst all listeners and I hope you'll tell your friends about it and share on all of your social platforms. Now, you all, I've gotten so much better with this technology thing. Like, I literally didn't even have to ask for any help. I have found everything I needed and I bought my own mic. So now I can just do this from my home. Isn't that so neat? Technology, ma'am. Well, let's jump into these current events. misconceptions that Black Lives Matter was founded solely for men or boys, that Alicia Garza, Patrice Cullors, and I created Black Lives Matter for Black women. It's important that all women of every age come together and see this and be a part of this. This is, Black women have always been the backbone of this country, always. We march for black women who have survived violence. It will take all of us to get to the other side. Now on that other side, that's where we got the freedom and the liberation and the love and all the beautiful things that we all want. So can we say it one more time together? Silence is not an option. We must band together and let our voices be heard in the service of community and the forward movement of our human collective. Our ingenuity, our vulnerability, our big hearts, our big minds, our big hips, our big mouths, our big hair. Y'all, I just love black women today. Black women matter. Black women matter. Black women matter. We're out here today where people are telling me be safe. I'm not afraid of fear. Just like Harry Tubman, she wasn't afraid of fear. Her own brothers wouldn't follow her to freedom. But we need to change that. So, this past week, Washington, D.C. held a march for black women in hopes of continuing efforts for a new social contract. What the organization means by this is that there needs to be an intersectional approach to social issues like poverty, immigration, housing, reproductive rights, etc that affect specific demographics more than they affect others. Moreover, the group has demanded for reauthorization against the Violence Against Women Act, which is supposed to expire on September 30th, 2018. The Violence Against Women Act passed in 1994 to help fund social service agencies for victims of sexual assault and violence. What's even more notable about this specific legislation is that it passed in the midst of Anita Hill's Senate testimony against the confirmation hearing of Clarence Thomas. So it's kind of like things are starting to come full circle. Hopefully, the Senate and House end up reauthorizing this important piece of legislation because not only will this be a huge burden financially for social services, but even more importantly, the message it sends to sexual assault and domestic violence victims. Implying that violence against women is not a priority will be at the forefront of this legislation debate because that very message is the one women will be receiving if the Senate and House do not reauthorize this act. Another thing that the March for Black Women is calling for is the removal of the gag order that the Trump administration implemented that literally bans the CDC from using words such as vulnerable, entitlement, diversity, transgender, fetus, 
evidence-based, and science-based. Interestingly enough, Trump's administration offered alternative phrases for certain words, but no alternatives for others. The drive and determination black women consistently have for issues that not only affect our com community, but others as well, has been nothing short of noteworthy. This is why on this episode, I've chosen to do something that all black women can relate to, our hair and our bodies. What I first want to preface this episode with is that, of course, not all black women have the same experiences in relation to our hair and bodies, yet the commonalities that many of us do have are worth talking about. And then later, we're going to discuss the over-sexualization of black women's physical bodies and how our bodies and our hairs have been intersecting entities that have been misrepresented and condemned by mainstream media and beyond. So, let's get to it. Historically, black women's bodies have been at the center of objectification, judgment, and othering since slavery. What I mean by this is that black women for centuries have literally had no control over what happened to our physical body, whether it's over sexualization or judgment in the sense that Eurocentric features are shown more often in the media and have been the standard in which women should strive to look and be like even invisibility in the media of inclusive representation of all hair types. Black women specifically have always needed to strive for a look that doesn't always reflect who we truly are. Not to mention, in the 1850s, black bodies were displayed in zoos and exhibits because they weren't seen as the norm. Yes, that really happened. My personal experience growing up concerning my hair was this. I wanted my hair to look like the white girls. I begged and begged and pleaded with my mom for a perm that would tame my long, unmanageable curls for years and years. It wasn't until I was 12 that she finally gave in. And in my world, having long straight hair like my white friends meant that I too could be pretty like them. For the longest time growing up, I can remember turning on the TV, looking at magazines, seeing Barbie dolls, and always, always, always seeing straight hair. Rarely did I see black women's natural hair being shown. And if it was shown, it was those Yara Shahadi curls that were highlighted, not the Lupita ones. What I'm really trying to say is this, the media rarely shows all types of black women's natural hair because black women's natural hair have always been thought of as nappy, coarse, and unappealing. On the flip side, there's this fascination about black women's hair. It's one of those comments that we get from time to time like, can I touch your hair? Or is that really your hair? Now, while these remarks may seem harmless, they definitely carry weight. It's the weight of assuming that because one's hair is long and straight, it couldn't possibly be our own. It's the weight of being associated with some type of animal by wanting to touch what doesn't belong to you. It's not black women being overdramatic or being too much because a lot of us don't want friends and definitely not strangers invading our personal space. It's simply us retaking what has been used as a tool of objectification for centuries. Black hair, it's a source of empowerment. The natural hair movement that started to shift in the early 2000s originated not from some overwhelming desire for black women to finally embrace what naturally grew up on our heads, although I'm sure that was the case for some, but it came from the desire to maintain our hair's health. When studies came out that began linking relaxer use to hair loss, chemical imbalance, heart disease, and other harmful health effects, 
women started reverting to the old school way of doing hair, which meant not putting those harmful chemicals in our heads. Was it met with pushback? Obviously, and not just from other racial demographics, but particularly older black people that have always been proponents of black girls not having nappy, unkept hair. Or in other words, black girls not wearing their hair in their normal puff or in their afro. Even while many black women began embracing not using chemicals to fix our hair, there's still an innate and overwhelming desire to even tame the nappy of, nappiest of curls to have those Zendaya curls because that's what's always, always, always being perpetuated in society to be more beautiful. But that's not even what's the most frustrating about having something that you literally cannot change that the media and those around you deem as unattractive. No, what's the most frustrating is that black people are actually policed for wearing their natural hair. In Louisiana, a sixth grader was kicked out of her school for wearing an unnatural hairstyle, whatever that's supposed to mean. She only had braids. A six-year-old boy wasn't allowed enrollment into a Florida school because his dreadlocks weren't suitable for the school's environment. But what does that even mean, not suitable for the school's environment? It's extremely frustrating to hear stories like this. And more so, stories like theirs reiterate the point that black hair has yet to be welcomed into all types of spaces and not just the ones we dominate. And what I mean by that, the ones we dominate such as sports, right? You all will see athletes wearing dreadlocks or braids or their natural hair. These are areas that we've been, that black people have been known to dominate. But what about the spaces that black people don't dominate like corporate America or education or healthcare? Areas like that need to be welcoming and inclusive to all types of black people and all types of black hair and black bodies. So let's shift focus for a few moments and talk about the hypersexualization of black women's bodies, which most, if not all black women, are all too familiar with. And like we talked about earlier, this oversexualization of our bodies, it has been a historic problem and not just something that has popped up in the mainstream media today. Although I'm sure that the reason people are more noticeable about things like this is because of the mainstream media today and because of the techno like the advances we've had with technology and social media. So it's much more widely known. But let's jump back a few decades or centuries. For example, Sarah Bartman, a South African woman in the 19th century, was displayed as a freak show attraction because of her elongated labial lips and large butt. Now, Obviously, her physique was nothing similar to that of a European woman's body type, especially during that time period. She was nicknamed the hot and tot Venus in reference to the Greek god of fertility. Now, is this to suggest that black women's bodies are only used for sex, sexual activities and for reproduction? Hmm. I guess I'll have to leave that with you all to decide. Now, do I think that something to this magnitude would happen present day? More than likely not. However, I think it's important to understand the past implications and how the physicality of black women's bodies were literally displayed for others to consume and were literally put on display for others to mock and ridicule and criticize and all of the above. What's up, this is Patrice Brown, AKA Teacher Bay. This is my first interview ever, finally breaking my silence. I feel comfortable enough to come out, finally. Make sure y'all, <laughs> make sure y'all follow me on Instagram at Tracy. L underscore underscore. Don't be saying that stuff to her live feed. Please She's not shaking booty for Martin Luther King Day, okay? Absolutely not. Yep, Atlanta's number one hip hop station is Hot 7.9. Your dirty J Nick Fly's guy on the radio. We in the same man, it's uh, Monday in A-Town, so you know we got Model Mondays. I got Miss Teacher Bay in the building. 
What's up, girl? Hey, everybody. So let everybody know your real name because now everybody just calls you Teacher Bay. Do people like out just be like, hey, Teacher Bay? Um, when I go to Alabama State football games, they definitely say, hey, Teacher Bay, is that Teacher Bay? You know, so yeah, they do. Okay, they okay, okay. So, so how <laughs> this newfound fame, man? How did it all happen? Oh goodness. Okay, so I'm really not sure how it all happened, but you know. Looking back on it, it could have been a hater. Um, or it could have been just somebody who saw me on Instagram posting pictures. Because I've been doing, if you've been following me forever, you would see that I always post in the classroom. You know right. what I'm saying? And unfortunately, I had to take those pictures down. But, um, yeah, it could have been somebody that out there was like, you know what? I don't like what she looked like. I don't like what she doing. So, you know, they wrote to a blog. And then um, Media Takeout got whiffed of it and tried to put a positive spin on it. Mm. Um, though they said I was a Fourth grade teacher. That you actually teach second grade. I'm with. I work with second grade. Absolutely. And how is that? Do, do they do they be on you? Because you know a lot of people might think have a misconception about um, you being a beautiful woman, but the kids are still children. Right. Um. Absolutely not. They are not on me like people think that they are. They look at me like, oh, that's the teacher. Oh, let me get my homework. Let me make sure I got everything. You know done or whatnot so all of that like oh you know she turning the kids on i mean i just feel like if you thinking like that it's something wrong with you period now fast forward to present day do y'all remember the story of tracy brown aka teacher bay she went viral on social media because she wore jeans to school that hugged her natural curves and the school's response after this picture was posted she was given guidance on her clothing. People took to social media and either supported her or responded with sexual contempt. Because of course, why would a black woman be allowed to wear something that shows off her natural body without being regarded as a sex object? The jeans she wore weren't even necessarily, actually not necessarily, they weren't provocative, they weren't sexually appealing, they just showed off her natural curves but people couldn't handle that. A news reporter named Demetria Ovalar shared a similar experience as Teacher Bay because she decided to wear something that showed off her figure. And the response to that, people condemned her because how dare she wear something so sexually provocative instead of choosing something that hides who she is and what she has. Her response replicated similar thoughts that I have myself because I've definitely experienced the body shaming she did and Teacher Bay did. She said, this is the way that I'm built. This is the way that I was born. I'm not going anywhere. And she's right. Black women and all of our hips, our lips, and our curves aren't going anywhere. And we see that in the media, especially through cultural appropriation and how black women have always dominated hip hop videos and Instagram, your Instagram feed because of the bodies we have. Now, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I think that you all have to look into your own biases and your own presuppositions and wonder, is the fact that black women are always overly sexual, overly sexualized a problem that has to do with my own implicit bias or is it something that the mainstream media perpetuates or is it both i personally think it's both people have to address their own implicit bias and the media has to stop perpetuating these stereotypes and these opinions about black women's bodies moreover i think it's critical to look deeper into why these stories resonate with so many black women the body type that these women specifically have have been extremely fetishized and sexualized because the specific parts of them have the, that have just the right amount of fat are the areas that we as a society sexualize more than other areas. And you all know which specific body parts I'm talking about. Not only that, because both of these women are light skinned, which can add to an entirely different element that we'll talk about in a later episode. But it's important to note, because even skin preference, along with body type, can either increase the sexualization of a black woman or decrease the sexualization of that black woman. 
We saw this phenomenon during the slave era because white-skinned women were given preference over dark-skinned women by the jobs they were given. However, in terms of the historical impact that this sexualization has had, is that often to be black and to be a woman means that you're expected to be the sex symbol because of the attributes you possess. Because of this, black women often hide or shy away from wearing specific clothing because of the remarks that go along with wearing said outfit. Then, on the flip side, when we do, especially if it's in a space that one is seen as formal or in a space that we most likely do not dominate, ridicule comes along. So how are we supposed to win? It's like a never-ending cycle that's constantly appropriated by celebrities, i.e. Kylie Jenner, Kim Kardashian, or vilified by others which we saw with the stories of Teacher Bay and Reporter Bay. I personally can relate to this issue because of my personal body type. I found that as I've grown older, certain clothing cannot be worn in specific settings like my job or to an interview because the fear, because of the fear that the only thing that will be noticeable about me is my curves and not what I'm bringing to the table. Even the comments I've specifically heard from men and especially older men, definitely aid in my decision making when choosing a certain outfit if I know I'm going to somewhere like even the gas station or the mall. Even informal settings like the, these two places have warranted sexually explicit remarks and gestures that no woman should ever be subjected to yet are on a daily basis because our culture has constantly perpetuated these stereotypes and opinions. Yet, I'm hopeful change is coming because even the stories of the two ladies I mentioned earlier are inspiring because they decided to embrace what's naturally theirs in a space that has yet to fully accept them. I hope and believe that other black women will follow their lead. And I hope that black women recognize the strength and the beauty and the desire, the innate desire that others have for them, because we all know that black women have always been copied, appropriated, whatever the case is. We have always been the leaders in propelling change and people re recognize that, yet people don't always give credit to it. I hope this episode was informative and thought provoking for all that listen and for those that will listen in the future. I hope that the historical perspective in which black bodies have consistently been objectified not only reaffirm black women that constantly battle feeling as if we're being too overdramatic when derogatory comments are made about a piece of ourselves we can't change and honestly shouldn't want to change. Black girls all across the world are beautiful, kind, intelligent, worthy, and all of the above, and should never ever feel belittled, demonized, or condemned about parts of ourselves that are naturally ours and that we should embrace. Remember, all of these opinions are my own, but they should be everyone else's. Have a woke Wednesday. <laughs>